Good evening. Thanks for being here. I love Sunday nights. It's my favorite part of church life. And the way we will typically use these Sunday nights are these, what we're calling Sunday night equip. And so using an opportunity just to talk about some things that we don't often have opportunity to talk about. And it's my personal conviction that the church needs to be discussing sexuality and really all that that entails is a very broad topic and technology a good bit more than we have. And it's challenging. So Sunday nights are a good way to come together and just discuss some of those. So in September, we'll, we'll let you know, I don't remember the dates. I think it's the fourth Sunday each time, but in September, I believe, Nathan, is that you or Cody? Cody, fourth or fifth Sunday? Fifth Sunday in September, we'll let you know. He's going to talk about evangelism in Abilene. Uh, as you probably know, it's really hard to do evangelism in Abilene because everybody is a Christian, right? So try to equip you there a little bit uh, about the unsaved Christian and what that looks like. There's a book called The Unsaved Christian. Cody's going to walk us through that. Then in October, fourth Sunday, Nathan's going to walk us through the Tech Wise family. So we'll be talking about technology. But tonight, we're going to talk about transgenderism. There's so much to say, so little time. But I want to begin just talking a little bit about our current context here, where we are, our, our time, our day, whether we like it or not, here we are. And to be honest, it's really a mess where we're at. After a generation of no-fault divorce, the unhinging of sex from procreation and marriage, the pre prevalence of pornography, cohabitation, we are in a sexual revolution. We have been now for decades, and now we're seeing gender separated from sexuality. We're even seeing gender separated from biology. It's like we're, we're trying to just come up with new ways. How many ways can we snub the creator? Sexuality now is seen as existing solely for personal satisfaction, personal self-actualization. And if gender gets in the way of that, well, we can just toss it aside. And it's led to all kinds of confusion. I think that's the best way to describe our current cultural context. It's just confused. Uh, maybe you've seen various things. I want to mention a few things that we've seen in the news. Maybe I think this was actually last year's Super Bowl. Um, the Celine Dion commercial. Y'all remember that? So that she comes into a nursery and there's your blues and your pinks and she comes in and she's wearing all black and she blows this dust and all the, the colors change from blue and pink to black. So it's her new line of clothing that is gender neutral. And here's what she says. She says, we may thrust these babies into the future, but the course will always be theirs to choose. And so now we can't really impose our binary genders on babies so now there's this movement saying we can't call them boys we can't call them girls we need to call them babies and later on they will decide it's not up to us it's not up to God it's up to them Germany now Holland on their birth certificates I think this will just continue to increase across the across the world instead of parents putting an M or an F on their birth certificate they can just put an X and later on that baby can decide on their own it's not just the world though I think in many ways we look at places in Europe and we get a sneak peek of where we will be. Now, I don't know if it'll be 10 years or 20, 20 years, but you look at Europe, America will soon be there. We're already seeing it, and it'll be the case here. So in the North Carolina school district, now teachers can't call their students boys or girls. They can only call them students. Toys R Us, getting rid of the boys section and the girls section. Same with Target. Target's changed their whole signs, and now you have cap guns right next to the Barbies. One of Alicia's peers, when she was a college student here, how long ago was that, 2004, 2005, was penalized in a missions class for using masculine singular pronouns generically instead of gender neutral pronouns. A long time ago. The, NI, the new NIV now has taken that route with Bible translations. And so instead of a masculine singular, singular pronoun, he, to refer to anyone, now it's they, and so they pluralize it. Even this week, we were on the campuses doing, a, you know, church fairs and whatnot, and I was told that you, they were encouraging, it's not fresh men, it's first years, so we can be more inclusive. And in many ways, this whole movement, this transgender movement, it's a development from the feminist movement, but it has been terrible for women in a whole host of ways. Like the whole bathroom policy issue, when you have men entering women's restrooms, women lose on a whole host of layers. When men can play sports, women lose, literally. So in 2014, a transgender female starts doing MMA, mixed martial arts. 
This, this person had grown up as a man, already had gone through puberty and decides to start fighting women. So she comes out and she fights uh, an opponent and she crushes her skull, gives her a concussion and she needed seven surgical staples. The fight lasted two and a half minutes. Here's what the loser, the female said about fighting a man. She said, quote, I fought a lot of women and I've never felt the strength that I felt in a fight as I did that night. I can't answer whether it's because she was born a man or not, because I'm not a doctor. I can only say I've never felt so overpowered ever in my life, and I am abnormally strong. I am an or abnormally strong female in my own right. I ironically, that, that man actually has lost since then. There was a day when a man would go to jail for hitting a woman, and now he's celebrated and paid big bucks. There's a trans Australian woman who's now breaking all kinds of records for weightlifting. In Connecticut here, a little bit closer to home, a boy who had ran track as a boy through middle school, enters high school, becomes a girl named Andrea, identified as a girl, and dominates the 100 and 200 meter races as a freshman. His times in those races would have put him in last place if the, he were running as a boy, but he runs as a girl and he dominates, wins the girl state championship in 2017. In Connecticut, all you gotta do is say, you know what, I'm a girl. Just say the word, no birth certificate changes, no hormones, no surgery, just a new name. Again, ironically, the next year, Andrea lost in 2018 by Terry Miller, another boy identifying as a girl. But even in Texas, Mac Beggs identifies as a female, won the Texas Girl State Wrestling title. So when people reject God, things just become confused. They become irrational. We can, if we can no longer distinguish boys from girls, we're in trouble. I want to show you a quick video. Maybe some, some of you have seen. It's about a four-minute video. Welcome to the future of America, ladies and gentlemen. Friends, when we have lost the ability to, a fi to tell a five-foot-nine white man that he is not, in fact, a six-foot-five Chinese seven-year-old woman, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. Maybe, maybe you are caught wind of Facebook. Facebook was coming into, the, this was years ago, they're coming into the issue of, okay, how do we handle this? Because you fill out your profile on Facebook and you used to decide, are you male or female? That's what the options used to be. And then they started multiplying those options. And it, it ultimately, eventually, they got to 71 options. Facebook had 71 options, yet it kept growing. And so you know what they did? They just gave you a custom option. You just fill in whatever you are. Here's how they broke the news when they did that. They said, when you come to Facebook to connect with the people, causes, and organizations you care about, we want you to feel comfortable being your true, authentic self. An important part of this is the expression of gender, especially when it extends beyond the definitions of just male and female. So today, we're proud to offer a new custom gender option to help you better express your own identity on Facebook. Really, I think it's really since Overfell in particular, but culture has shifted so incredibly fast, hasn't it? I mean, the last five years, what we've seen has been staggering. When I was in my previous church in Dripping Springs, they had a bathroom issue there. And so they accommodated and they let the child use the faculty restroom because it was a boy wanting to be a girl. They wanted to accommodate. They said, you know what? You can have your own. You can have the faculty instead of, and they didn't tell the parents anything, by the way. Parents learned when when they conceded and finally let her in the girl's restroom and girls came home saying, hey, there's a boy in our restroom. They didn't give any notice. But the thing was, when they gave the, the child accommodations in the faculty school, it wasn't enough. And it wasn't that it wasn't enough for the child. It wasn't enough for the parents. And that's the issue here. It's always the parents. The parents wanted, demanded their own uh, didn't want it to be the faculty restroom. And listen, I don't know that we have anything in ASD yet, but I did a little homework and there's already 19 pro transgender titles in the libraries of AISD, 51 total copies. And so make sure you know what your children are, are reading. So let's talk terminology here. What are we talking about? Well, transgenderism is about how people feel and think. That's what is meant by gender identity. It is their internal sense of gender. Here's how one famous transgender man put it. It's not about what's between your legs, but between your ears. Or here's what another woman said, another transgender woman said. This pink and blue thing is a nonsense. It's a hegemony that we need to challenge. We all need to be free. The human heart is the most important organ, not what goes on down there. And so that's important to get right. What we're talking about here is feelings. We're not talking about biology. 
There is zero objective medical or scientific test to determine transgenderism. It's all about how you feel. Maybe some of you have seen uh, the unicorn. I got a picture of the unicorn here for you. It's already being shifted, but this is what is being pushed in government schools to teach children at a very young age. This is where we got to have conversations early, parents. But this is the gender unicorn, so you can see there you have the rainbow, what's going on in between the ears, and that's your gender identity. That's how you feel. Are you female, woman, girl, male, man, boy, others? Then you have your gender expression. F feminine, masculine, other, that's, that's your whole self. How do you express yourself? There's your sex assigned at birth. Is it female, is it male, is it other, or is it intersex? We'll say more about that in a minute. Then you have your heart. Who are you physically attracted to? Are you physically attracted to women, men, other genders? And then who are you emotionally attracted to? Is it women, men, or other genders? And so you get a blank slate. You decide. It's known as gender dysphoria. It's defined as a marked incongruence between one's experienced and expressed gender and assigned gender. In, in most definitions, it says this, this incongruence needs to last six months or longer. And the reason is, it's often fleeting. It often changes. When children who reported transgender feelings were tracked without medical or surgical treatment at both Vanderbilt University and London, neither are conservative bastions, at London's Portman Clinic, 70 to 80% of them spontaneously lost those feelings over time. And how many are experiencing this gender dysphoria? Between one, about roughly between one and 12,000 males and one in 28,000 females have gender dysphoria. Cisgender is someone whose gender identity matches their assigned at birth gender. Some also call that non-trans. That's presumably all of you. Non-binary is an umbrella term for someone who does not identify as a male or a female non-binary. Intersex is when a person is born with biological attributes of both men and women or whose biological attributes do not fit with societal assumptions about what constitutes male or female. So this is more, this is more of a genetic deformity that's often appealed to, but this is very, 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 very rare. One in 5,000 births. And that really is a different conversation from gender dysphoria. So how do we get here? Well, I mentioned a few things. I mean, you think about the sexual revolution with no-fault divorce and with pornography and the separation of sex and, and marriage and sex and procreation. But also, again, just, the, just what I mentioned this morning, Genesis 3, autonomy. The fact that we want to rule our own worlds. Remember the iPhone, the iMic, the I, I, I. We don't want to be told what to do, right? Nike, just do it. BK, have it your way. Easy spirit conforms to your foot so you don't have to conform to anything. The issue is at the end of the day, we don't want authority. We don't want boundaries. We don't want to draw lines. We don't want God at the end of the day. And again, it started in Genesis 3. That's why this has always been a problem and always will be a problem. So that's kind of where we are. It's kind of our current cultural context. Much more could be said. How should we respond? How should the church respond? Number one, we've got to speak with clarity. In the midst of the confusion and honestly the goofiness, we need to be those who speak clearly. And we remind people, one of history, and remind people that for the whole of human existence, society has acknowledged binary genders. Humans don't create our identity. In fact, it's interesting, the only title, uh, the only word that Jesus, our Lord, puts after the word self is not identity. What is it? It's denial. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Humans don't create identity. It is a given. Genesis 1.27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. That's really the most important two verses in this conversation. God's the creator, therefore he's the authority. And to be made in the image of God is to be created male and female. It's God who made us, not we ourselves. And he made us embodied creatures. Our bodies matter. I mentioned this morning the resurrection. We need to have a strong view of the human body. We have objective biology. Gender's not a small thing. It's not some surface level aspect of our humanity. It's not like a set of clothes that we can just take off and put on a different set. No, our gender is part and parcel of who we are as persons. It's biological, it's anatomical, our chromosomes are different, our brains are different, our voices are different, our body types are different, our strength is different, our reproductive systems, different, existing, non-existing, and the difference is due to God's creative design for humanity. This is his thing. 
Our biological sex is a gift we receive, not a choice we make. Our gender is a gift we receive, it's not a choice we make. Being male and female is essential to being made in the image of God and scripture is very clear. And of course, biology proves what scripture says. It's interesting, sometimes Christians are called anti-science and it's like in this area, it's the transgender movements that's anti-science. The transgender mantra is anatomy isn't destiny. But bodies are stubborn things. Here's how Andrew Walker puts it. He says, your psychology, your feelings, cannot change your ontology, your being. Your feelings can't change your being, can't change who you are. So it's not surprising that people who actually do go and get full transitions The successful stories of transitions are few and far between. So we've got to speak clearly. We've got to speak clearly because if we lose objectivity, anything becomes possible, right? You can say I'm six foot seven, seven year old Chinese woman. Who are you to say? If we lose objectivity, anything is possible. When identity is up to us, anything can go. So what will stop a 50 year old man from identifying as a 17 year old woman so he can get in the locker room? Personally, Scott Kemp told me that you can get free Dr. Pepper at Whataburger for seniors. I want to identify 65 so I can get a free DP. (laughs) Maybe I remember the white woman, Rachel Dolezal, got in trouble for lying about her race. She was white, had white parents, and she said she identified as a black woman. Who's to say she's wrong if it's all up in the air? If biology doesn't matter, if objectivity doesn't matter, Rachel can be a black woman. Or maybe you heard about the 69-year-old Dutch man who actually went to court about this. He petitioned the court to change his legal age from 69 to 49. He said, I don't feel 70, I feel 50. Here's what he said. He says, uh, with the face I have, I will be in a luxurious position because nowadays in Europe and in the United States, we are free people. We can make our own decisions if we want to change our name or if we want to change our gender. So I wanna change my age, my feeling about my body and my mind is that I'm about 40 or 45. Who's going to say otherwise? So he goes to court to get his legal age changed. Here's how NPR reported. They said, the judge expressed some skepticism, but also noted that changing the sex on a birth certificate as transgender people have the right to do once was impossible and is now allowed. There will be no basis for saying one can't. The precedent's already been set. Now the court on that first one ruled no, at least for now. But when you lose objectivity, anything becomes possible. And so now there's a young Norwegian woman who claimed to have the sensory powers of a cat, thought she was born of the wrong species. Who's to say? She self-identifies as a cat. Who are you to say otherwise? And mark my words, pedophilia is next. In fact, it really already is. I don't think it was America, but you can Google. There's a TED talk out there of a woman defending pedophilia, pushing for affirmation and approval, saying that just like heterosexual orientation, pedophilia is an unchangeable sexual orientation. Friends, if we can convince a culture that a boy is a girl, what else can you convince a culture of? The nature of reality is at stake here. And so we've gotta be clear. We gotta be clear about what God's word says. We gotta be clear about the harm. We gotta be clear about how we teach about biblical manhood and womanhood. How we teach about biblical models of masculinity and femininity. We need to avoid caricatures. That's part of the problem. I wish I had more to say about that. We teach what the Bible teaches about what a man is to be and what the Bible teaches about a woman is to be. Speak clearly about the fact that we are created. But we know that the Bible doesn't stop in Genesis 1, right? It goes on. And we know that Genesis 3 is right there. We see the fall that affects every part of us. And we know that we're broken. And part of the way we show our rebellion, if you remember from Romans chapter one, is that we refuse to go along with the way God has created the world. It's part of our rebellion. But the doctrine of the fall also helps us have compassion, helps us understand the dysphoria. Like we shouldn't be that surprised by that or any other kinds. It's a broken world and sin affects all of us in various ways. I'll say more about that in a minute. But first, so speak clearly. That's what we've got to do. We've got to be honest. That's the hard part. And so secondly, we've got to speak with conviction and courage. You will be accused of hate speech by saying the things I've already said. You'll be called transphobic. And here's the thing about our culture. Tolerance is no longer enough. They demand affirmation. 
You must agree with what they say. Professor Robbie P. George, a strong Catholic moral theologian, says that normal authoritarians forbid people from speaking the truth. Totalitarians force people to speak untruth. And that's where we're headed. Tolerance is not enough. You must agree with their ideological assumptions. A recent guide to transphobic hate crime defines transphobia this way. It's intolerance of gender diversity based around the idea that there are only two sexes, male or female, which you stay in from birth. Brothers and sisters, according to this definition, every Bible-believing Christian is transphobic. So with this and with a whole host of other areas, especially sexuality, we're just going to have to get used to not being liked. We're going to be called haters. We can be the kindest people, the most gracious, and we're still going to be called hate speech. We've got to get used to it. In this area and a host of others, increasingly, we are actively at odds with contemporary culture. Didn't used to be that way, right? Some of you elderly folks remember when the church was right in with the culture, right? It was a comfortable time to be a Christian, even respected. That day's over already. We're in a post-Christian nation. So increasingly, it will be hard to stand for what the Bible teaches. And that's why you see churches at church and church after church after church is compromising on these sorts of issues. Acts 5.41, the apostles left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer the dishonor of the name. That's what we got we to gotta be. We got to be able to speak the truth, speak with clarity, and be okay not being the popular person in the room. So speak with clarity, speak with courage. Three, speak with love. Christians do not mock, we do not belittle those battling gender dysphoria. Zero bullying, zero harassment, zero jokes. And here's a, here's a fine line, though. The fine line is that you can avoid all that, and you can be humble, and you can be gracious. You can be winsome in speaking the content you'll speak. You'll still be called unloving. That's the fine line that we've got to balance. But we know the difference, right? To tell the truth is the most loving thing we can do. May lose friends, may be verbally persecuted, but to tell the truth is the most loving thing we can do. So we speak with love and we speak with compassion for those experiencing this distress. We do not dismiss their mental struggle. It is real. They are hurting. And so we have compassion with friends and family members in this. The world is a mission field. It's not a battlefield. And our posture and our tone ought to show that. And so we offer them good news. First and foremost, that's what we have to offer. We have good news for them and for any others. We offer them true joy. Why? Because true joy is found in God's design. He knows best. If a fish up and decides he wants out of the water, that's not freedom, right? True freedom is being found, it's found in being who God made us to be. And so we've got to convince people of that. His ways are best. He knows best. And the beauty of the way he's designed the world is not only is it right, it's best. Like he wants our joy. He just wants our joy in him. And so it's an invitation to the good life, the good news we offer. So we speak with love. We speak with compassion, knowing that they are hurting. And they are hurting. They are some of the most emotionally fragile people in our culture. Transgender people have shockingly high rates of substance abuse, of anxiety, of depression, of other mental health problems. 66%, two-thirds of trans people suffer from multiple psychological disorders. Their rates of depression and anxiety far surpass the rates of those in the general population. 41% of trans men and women attempt suicide. 41%. Do you know how much, what percentage of the general population? 1.6. They are 19 times more likely to commit suicide than the general population. And those who go through full transitions are no different. It doesn't work. That's what we're seeing again and again and again. It doesn't work. It doesn't fix the issue. So Dr. Paul McHugh, he used to be the psychiatrist in chief at John Hopkins. John Hopkins was one of the pioneering hospitals in terms of these procedures, transition procedures. He quit doing them. Here's what he said. I concluded that to provide a surgical alteration to the body of these unfortunate people was to collaborate with a mental disorder rather than to treat it. 
He, he would do it. They would pioneer it. They saw it didn't work. It actually makes it worse. It doesn't treat it. It collaborates with the mental disorder. And listen, these stats are no different in places where it's totally approved and affirmed. No places like California or Sweden or Holland. The stats are the same. Affirmation and inclusion do not solve deep psychological problems. And so we speak with love. We speak with compassion, knowing that we're all sinfully broken. Every one of us is sexually broken in some way, some form or fashion. All of us are battling to be like Christ in this area of our life. And so we come in, as Taylor mentioned, at the foot of the cross equal. Sinners in need of grace, all of us broken. So we have compassion knowing the false affected us all. Desperate need of grace, desperately in need of the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And praise God, it is available to all. Now I'm going to stop here and I want to give us an opportunity to talk. Uh, any questions? There's a lot more I could say, but I want to open it up to you for a little bit. Uh, you know, I'm a public educator uh, working in elementary school. And you mentioned earlier uh, the prevalence of the literature and that kind of stuff, you know, within the libraries, those kinds of things in public schools. Um, I have worked with and currently work with students getting at the elementary age who are being raised by their parents as the opposite gender. Um, but, you know, there's legal implications for school personnel working within school districts and such. What would be your advice as far as, in a situation like that, how to handle that kind of a situation? Um, you know, my, my better judgment kind of leans more towards prayer and love uh, of the individual and modeling. Um, and that's kind of how, up until this point, um, I, I kind of handled those situations and conversations with kids uh, in that way. Gosh, yeah, you're in a really hard position. I don't know the legality on what you can say, certainly what you said prayerful love, modeling it. One of the things that I think we can do, and this, this is really with any conversation with, with people about the gospel, is put yourself in the position of a questioner. And Jesus did this all the time. You read the gospels, you look at the way he handled things, he often asked questions. And so be an intentional question asker uh, of how things are going, especially in that realm and not being afraid to ask pointed hard questions to get them talking, which maybe could open a door and invitation. But guys, guys like you who are in the school, is really, it's really hard to find this balance. And I often fall back. I mean, you got to be careful and you got to know the rules. You don't want to lose your job. But I think we've got to come to a conclusion. I'm speaking here specifically to Southside Baptist Church right now. Increasingly, even Christ, other Christians, I mean, this is a solid Bible-believing church is why I say that, lacks the courage to tell the truth. And that's what's desperately needed is a clear compassionate, I'm not over you, but this is just not going to end well. And God has a better way type posture. And so where you can do that, I would encourage you to take advantage of those opportunities, but you've got a fine line to walk. So yes, absolutely prayer, demonstrating the gospel, but where possible, because no one else is, that's the thing. Even other, a lot of other Christians who don't have a backbone like so many of y'all do, they're just not doing it. And so who has the, who has the, the, the humble posture and the biblical conviction to get people thinking. It's just amazing. I'd love to hear, hear stories at some time. It's, I love when I hear stories where there's someone and they're going a certain way and the Lord sends someone in their life that just kind of has a hard statement or a hard question that they haven't grappled with and how often the Lord uses that. Sets them aback like, whoa, 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 I hadn't thought about that. And it just haunts them, you know, until the Lord's just given the Lord fodder to use. So, yeah, good question. Other questions? And you had said that people think they're male, female, and other, what, what are the other <laughs> genders that they think there are? Well, the, so remember the unicorn, you could basically pick a different, can we throw that back up there? Y'all able to do that? You could basically pick a different answer for each one. So you have your identity, you have your expression, you have what you were assigned at birth, you have your physical attraction, then you have your emotional attraction. And I can't even keep up with all, Facebook couldn't even keep up, there were 71, I can't even keep up with all what those are variously called. But the big ones are the ones I mentioned. But obviously here you've got quite a few uh, possibilities of diversity. And if you're the person who picks one, three, one, two, you want to have a Facebook title. 
and they just couldn't keep up with, uh, with it, so they gave up. Other questions, thoughts, comments, experiences anyone likes to share? I have a friend who uh, is a mother of five, and her oldest, she just has one boy, and he's 14, and he's been struggling with, um, especially this past year. Uh, you know, he's been telling her that he's not sure in the house, and, you know, he, he thinks he's a girl. He's thought he's a girl for a very long time, he has all the sisters. Um, and especially with someone who's stealing and sneaking out and doing all this stuff, so she finally caved um, and is allowing him. And so this school year, he's going to present a job and <coughs> Jessica. And she's struggling with it as a Christian. And I don't really know what to say to her as far as, you know, like, other than I'm praying for you and to say love. And I also don't really know where to like, send her or lead her as far as someone who is well-read and spoken about this, but also someone for her son. Mm-hmm. You know, is there, are there pastors or, or somebody specific that comes to mind that he could maybe reach out to or watch a video? Yeah. Yeah, there's a... Um Yes, there's lots of resources. Um, first off, where's the dad? Is the dad in the picture? Dad's in the military, but the dad is not a practicing Christian, and that's just the whole thing. Yeah. He's in the military. He's gone a lot and just not really, he, he's not really there. Yeah. So many of the roots of these problems are they're right there. We say a lot at Southside that as the men go, so go the church, and we believe strongly in what the Bible teaches about men leading the home. And so just fathers hear this, how influential you are for better or for worse, present or absent, how much you shape the lives of your children. So that's hard, right? It's an orphan in some ways. So the local church is his hope and really both of their hopes. So both of them need relationships and discipleship. That what he needs more than anything is a positive Christ-centered male presence in his life to show him what it is to be a man. That's what's needed. It's what's needed a long time ago, right? That's what's needed at two and three and four and five. So it gets really hard now. Uh, and the same with her. And so what I would do, if you know her well enough, if you're able to, I'm going to mention some resources. There's a lot more than, than I brought up here. But say, hey, you know, I know you're going through this. You may not agree with the thing. Can we walk through this together? And so to move her in a place where she can actually lead her son. But it's, it's a fine balance between love and humility and patience, but also knowing that that is not going to end well. And so you've got to balance that relationship with how firm can you push. But if she can get into a a healthy church to where she will have people like you and others, and then he can too, have have another old, ideally older man pouring in his life, investing in him and and teaching him. It's heartbreaking. Others? So while we're speaking, Uh, say there's a man who identifies as a woman and says, please call me her, call me she, you know. How do you go about doing that? Well, I'm going to stand for truth and I need to tell you the truth, but be respectful and... Yeah, great question. So if you couldn't hear Anna ask, so what if there's someone, transgender person, who's asking you to call her, call them the other pronoun? You know, so say it's a man dressed as a woman, wants to be called her. I think that's one of those areas where it's a great issue that you of your own conscience need to land on on what, what you think is right. On the one hand, what you're doing is affirming it, right? And you're also, remember that, so there, here's this person right here. You gotta remember that this person's not my only audience, right? We've also got another audience, an audience of much more important. God also hears us. And so this is where it's kind of a conscience issue. I know I have some Christian friends who could not call them the contrary pronoun because they believe they'd be calling them what God has not made them. And so they're, their fear of the Lord would not allow them. I just tell you, me personally, uh, depending on the circumstance, if it was more of an evangelistic contact, especially a briefer one, and I wasn't going to be able to build a a relationship, I would concede. Uh, Just to remove a petty stumbling block, in my opinion, some of y'all might have very strong opinions about it. That to me would be just a small way that I could concede to get to the gospel. Because if I didn't, they're probably not going to hear anything I said. Well, you won't even, knowing before the Lord that I don't, agree, but I'm trying to be wise to, to get to truth. So, but at the end of the day, heaven's a gray. So I think you just got to land where you feel you don't want to violate your conscience. Good question though. Going to be an increasingly relevant question for all of us. So as a mom,
knowing when is the right time to bring this up to our grades. Uh, they are homeschooled, nothing against public school, but they're homeschooled, and so I know kids their age are probably getting that uniform thing at school, and they're not. And I, I don't want to shelter them in the sense that they're ignorant and naive completely, but how do I bring that to their attention when they're around other kids who, who already know about it? Yeah, when is it appropriate to bring this up? Yeah, when is it appropriate to bring it up with kids? I don't know that you can go too soon, specifically when those early years, three, four, five, a positive portrayal. We need to be talking about the image of God. We need to be talking about Genesis 1. We need to be talking about why they are, how they are, what it looks like to be a man of God, what it likes. So that positive, you can't start early enough. Talking some of the specifics, um, I think, yeah, I think five's go time. I think, I think you really can't get early enough because they will be exposed to it and it's better. They need to hear from y'all, not from someone else. And so that when they do, it's not a surprise. And here's the thing as parents, I just think we're naive about how much our, parent, our kids know or are exposed to. Uh, even if, I mean, I, I could tell you stories about how much my, what was he? I guess he was a kindergartner, learned when we sent him to a classical Christian school. <laughs> he came home with all kinds of things. So, um, so earlier the better. Listen, I mean, I was so, so, how hard, this is kind of a different scenario, but how hard was it to access pornography 15, 20, 30, 35, 40 years ago compared to now? I was exposed to pornography as a five-year-old at a friend's house. And so maybe that's part of my experience is like sooner the better. So we just need to be having, having just making disciples. This is just the heart of it is you can't really start too soon with teaching littles what it means and about their gender and their God-givenness. And, and with that comes with the God's our creator and it's good and he's our authority. And I'll put some resources up on Facebook tomorrow that, that will be geared towards little ones, but there's several little resources that just talk about the body, talk about gender, talk about male and female, talk about the image of God for a three or four or five-year-old. <laughs> uh, are you familiar with the book called Raising Modern Day Knights? How would that uh, help the parents in this uh, troubling age? Yeah, yeah. A lot of our guys do, do the whole shebang. But if you don't, Raising Modern Day Knights, for men in particular, is a great book to just to disciple boys into men, absolutely. And listen, you know, there's a war against boys in our culture. There just is a war against them. And so more than ever, dads, if you've got boys, you've got to be training them and teaching them. There's a book called War Against Boys. I recommend it. Sociology book, not a Christian book, but maybe one or two more. <coughs> to how, as dads or moms and parents, how we react <coughs> to our kids asking them questions, <coughs> and you know, how can we help? Yeah. Make, make, make it so that they're not afraid to ask us again. <laughs> yeah, great question. Talking about the birds and the bees, I got a, I got a quick poll real quick if you're comfortable. Um, if, you're, if your parents to, told you about the birds and the bees, raise your hand. About half probably. Okay. His question was, how do, we, how do we not make it awkward? And I think that's really a really good question. We don't. We can't make it awkward. And so that's why as we talk about it again and again and again, make it just the norm so that when they're exposed to various things, they're not afraid to come talk to us. And I think dads in particular really struggle with this. I don't know why we really very uncomfortable around this. Again, there's all kinds of resources, Pathway to Purity, Passports of Purity is one of them. There's another one, again, I'll post these on our Facebook page tomorrow uh, that, that, that help you walk through with one we like. Uh, do you know what it's called? It's seven, seven weeks, seven studies. Say that again. Seven Steps of Biblical Sexuality is really good for like six, seven-year-old, eight-year-old. Even has uh, diagrams of anatomy and that sort of thing that are, that are good for kids. Not, not what you're thinking. Helpful, age appropriate. <laughs> we'll talk about how, you know, where babies come from, that sort of thing. Um, so being proactive and trying not to wait till they come to you and making it just a safe place to talk. 
the best you can. So basically fake it, hide your awkwardness. Because <laughs> we're all uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable, but it's needed. More than ever is it needed for us to be talking about it regularly and having us as a safe place for them to come and ask any question they want. Sorry. You know that former college student, Kamala, she graduated and did speech pathology, and she was concerned because her first assignment kind of in her training was to tell I think it was a young man who learned how to speak like a woman because he was wanting to trans transition to that. And so, um, you know, we prayed for her and with her and just she felt like that she had to do it because it was part of her training. And um, so what do you, you know, like how do you navigate those kind of things when it's part of your job? And I'm kind of like, just yeah, I mean, it's a similar situation. I think this is where the beauty of the church comes in. So when you are stuck, okay, here I am, what's the right view to having a community of people or a D group of two, three, or four, to just to hash it out and try to seek wisdom? Because so many of these areas are going to become wisdom issues, meaning there's not going to be a clear black on a whole lot of them or a clear white. And so what's the best way forward, all things considered? And I often lean, me personally, speaking personally, I often lean uh, towards gospel conversations. What is going to get me to that? And my principle here is not total pragmatic. It's a principle of pragmatism. And it's the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 9. So to the weak, I became weak. To the strong, I became strong. To the Jews, I became like a Jew. To the Gentiles, I became like a Gentile. This is the Apostle Paul. And he's flexing in all these various ways. Why? That I might save some. And so that's a little bit, that's a little bit different than like saving your job. Uh, but that's the principle that's going to guide me a lot. Am I able to do something that maybe bugs me a bit? I certainly am uncomfortable, but I think that will help me get around to the gospel. Because listen, this morning we talked about the call, right? How does God save? He saves through the gospel. He doesn't save through having the right gender. And so this is where when we believe in the confidence of the gospel message, we want to get there. We want to get with the death and resurrection of Jesus, not this stuff. So that's where I'm going to lean, but man, where you have multiple counselors, there's abundance of wisdom found in multiple counselors, so you can try to figure out what's the best route. But I think increasingly we will lose jobs. It's just, it's just where we're going to be headed. What are your thoughts between, so protecting our children, we want to, and it's our job to protect our children, but not hiding the truth in the world that we live in. Like, for example, our four year old. They introduced um, the lesbian relationship on um, and so we were like, are you <laughs> so obviously we don't watch that anymore, but it was I mean, I think at this point not much is gonna trust me anymore, but that was shocking to me. Yeah. And so but so of course we need to protect her from that, but but you don't want to hide the truth. So like that's so hard for me personally to navigate where to fall on that spectrum. Can you speak to that person? <laughs> Yet again, no black, no white, right? But I'm going to lean towards f full teaching at a, at a younger age is usually the way I'm going to lean because of examples like that, because of exposure. And I want to be there. I want to be ready when that's, that imagination is sparked. I want to be there to f fill into that. And so as much as we can to be proactive so that they're ready for that. And the language that we just need to get used to saying as Christians is we're different. We say that a lot at our, at our house on a whole host of issues. <laughs> We're different. We're different. And so trying to teach them from the word, give them a biblical worldview so that when they see that, they realize, and hopefully if the Lord grants them faith, they see that or they see it in real life. That's the other thing is they're going to see it out and about increasingly, even in Abilene, right? So you can't totally hide. They see it. They have categories for it. My goal is to have categories. They see that at the Mall of Abilene and they think, well, God created us. God knows best. I trust God. I trust my parents and he knows best and he's created men and women to be together and they make babies and that's not the way he's created and there can be no babies. So I'm not going to go that route. And hopefully a posture of, and we'll pray for them. That's what we, that's the goal. That's pretty idealistic, but so speaking into the opportunities, teachable moments, and that certainly is a teachable moment. If Southside is going to be a place for all people, including the trans people, would be welcome, what would it look like? What would that look like? 
Well, it would look like we look right now, I think, by the availability of the gospel. Kind of like I mentioned, the beauty of it is we're all on level ground. And I hope that the, the posture and tone of anyone teaching in any level is a gospel-focused culture so that you can be greedy, lustful, lustful heterosexual, lustful homosexual, transgender, and you're going to hear the compelling message that Jesus saves sinners and all sin can be forgiven. So really it comes down to a gospel-centered phase of ministry. In terms of adapting to that or in any other way, we're just not going to do. What about for young families like us who are trying to decide where to send our kids to school? Oh, man. All right, we got to go. <laughs> now, I mean, here's the thing. You, there's a lot of great options. And I, what I love about Southside is Southside has always had a great mixture of uh, public school, private school, homeschool. As long as I've known Southside, there's been a great combination of that. Uh, homeschool is not perfect. None of them are perfect. Christian school is not perfect. Um, public school is not perfect. The, the benefits of some Christian schools, some Christian schools are less Christian than others. You know, there might just be a prayer at the end. So that's an important question. And I don't know enough about schools in Abilene. Uh, homeschool, you have the, probably the most opportunity to speak in to kids. Here's the thing with public school. Here's what increasingly we've got to do as parents of public school kids is we are still responsible for the education of our kids. And so there's no plug and play anymore. That might've been the case, you know, 20 years ago, but now there needs to be conversations daily. Tell me about your day. Tell me what you're learning, being aware of curriculum, because this is where there's a book, uh, not a Christian book and not a, it's, it's a book uh, by a sociologist and it says, get out now. And it's talking about the public schools, particularly in the Northeast and the, I mean, excuse me, yeah, Northeast, Northwest, because this ideology is being pushed most heavily in the public schools. These students that were interviewed here in the Northeast that we just saw, those are products of public schools. So more than ever, parents need to disciple kids. And if you're in public school, that doesn't mean, okay, I'm checking out and letting letting the government do it all. No, that means you're entering in and having conversations about what's being taught. So really the same answer is the answer, regardless of your educational choices, parents must be intentional. Parents must be all in having conversations about what's happening. And increasingly some of those conversations are gonna be deconstructive, uh, showing how that's actually not true. And that's hard. That's, those are hard conversations to have. But starting early and praise God, y'all have an opportunity, right? St the earlier you start, to build those categories and fill in worldview, the better off they're going to be when they get exposed as a sixth grader to this kind of, you know, to the unicorn or whatever it is. All right, I want to let you out at seven. Let me mention a few resources. There's a lot more, but, um, and again, I'll post these on our Facebook page. This one is just called Gender, a conversation guide for parents and pastors. Y'all can read this book, right? It's by Brian Seagraves and Hunter Levine. Really good, really short, helpful book. It'll also point to more resources if you want them. That's one I want to recommend. Next one, another same series, little series, really helpful. It's called Transgender by Vaughn Roberts. Vaughn Roberts is a really solid author. Our students went through his book on biblical theology recently. He's also unique in that he's a pastor, but he's a celibate pastor because he's attracted to men. He's a man who's attracted to men. And so he knows that he can't act on that because he's a Christian. So he is resolved to be celibate for life. He hates that desire, he fights it, but it's a reality that has not left him yet. So he has a little bit of a unique, unique perspective on some of the emotional challenges that transgender people face as well. So just called Transgender, Little Yellow Book, good one. This is more for you parents to equip you. Uh, this is less for so either of these could be read by students and obviously the first one's parents. This one's a little more meaty and it's called God and the Transgender Debates by Andrew Walker. What does the Bible actually say about gender identity? And I know most of you, you know, probably don't want to read this stuff, but I just want to encourage you to think about it. Increasingly, this will be our issue. So the more Christians we have that are able to have cogent conversations about these issues, the better. So. And then finally, this one's more, this covers a little bit more. This one's a new book by a guy at a Moody uh, Moody Bible Institute, and it's called Holy Sexuality in the Gospel. It's got chapters on lust, homosexuality, transgender, um, sin in general, holiness, the temptations, marriage, and it's, it's not super long. So, Holy Sexuality in the Gospel. So, I would 
encourage you to check those out and they will all point you to more if you're hungry for more. Um, the ERLC, the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission is part of the Southern Baptist Convention. So we have a few entities as a Southern Baptist Convention, the seminaries, IMB, NAMB. Check out ERLC.org and just go in their search bar and type in transgender and you're gonna have a lot of resources. Andrew Walker is one of their fellows there. So lots of videos, lots of short blogs that'll help you with conversation that are shorter than books. So ERLC would be a good place to look as well. Challenging times, isn't it? But we are at a time now that is more like the first century than ever before. And so there's excitement as well and opportunity, even though there's a lot of pain and tears as well. Never too early to start. Let me pray for us.